good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. So this session is called GitOps to Automate the Setup, Management, and Extension of a Kubernetes Cluster. And uh, I'm going to talk about how the session is going to be uh, structured and how we might need to move around a little bit in the room. Uh, but first, uh, my name is Kim Schlesinger. I am a developer advocate at DigitalOcean. I focus on our uh, Kubernetes education. And prior to DigitalOcean, I was a site reliability engineer at a company called Fairwinds. And I'm actually a career changer. So uh, before all of that, I was a primary school teacher, and I was an instructional coach and curriculum designer. So I like bringing tech and education together. And what we're going to be doing today is uh, I've created a repo for you um, that we're going to be working through. So um, let's take a look at this. <laughs> So this is the repo. Uh, there are five chapters in the repo. Um, and the goal of this workshop is for you to have some experience getting like an aha moment, either with infrastructure as code or uh, with GitOps. And so if you look through the chapters, you see the first chapter is we're going to set up a cluster uh, using Terraform. The next thing that we'll do is we'll install and set up a Flux CD for continuous delivery. Uh, the next thing is that we'll use a project called Seal Secrets uh, to encrypt uh, Kubernetes secrets so that you can store your secrets in a public Git repo. Uh, the next thing that we'll do is we'll use a project called Crossplane to make the cluster that we've spun up uh, a universal control plane so that we can create other cloud resources from within that cluster. And then finally, uh, we'll tear down our cluster. Um, so if you're using uh, a cloud provider like DigitalOcean, uh, that you don't get charged for any usage that you want, don't, uh, don't want to be charged for. And so I know that workshops are really tricky, and my goal is for you to have an experience, um, but the internet can be uh, really unreliable at this venue. Uh, and so here's how we're going to do this. Um, so if you are someone who is interested in watching me do a demo of all of this, and you maybe want to follow along or you just want to observe, then uh, in, a, in a few moments, I'm going to invite you to move toward the front of the room, uh, so we might need to shift. If you're someone who's sitting in the audience and you're thinking, eh, I already know a little bit of this, like maybe I'm already familiar with Terraform, but I'm really interested in digging into Flux or Crossplane, you're absolutely welcome to skip ahead to those chapters. They have very good instructions in them. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll see how this works. What I'd like you to do, if you're someone who's skipping ahead and isn't going to follow along with me, I'm going to have you move to the back of the room. And I have uh, two colleagues here, um, Adam Wolf Gordon and Wayne Warren. They're both engineers at DigitalOcean, but they'll be available for you to ask for help if you're someone who's working ahead and you get stuck. They'll be there to help you troubleshoot. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it, if you want to move lockstep with me, you'll move to the front. If you want to move on your own, uh, you'll go to the back. And if you are someone who wants to watch just a little bit of this workshop and then uh, step out after a little bit, that's totally fine. The goal of this workshop is for you to get what you need to out of it. So uh, if you need to leave, that is no problem. So. Um, if you are following along uh, with the workshop and you want to spin up a cluster using DigitalOcean, we've got a promo code for you. So in this section in the readme, it says promo code. Uh, you'll get 100 uh, US dollars worth of credit. And the way that you apply the credit is that you create a DigitalOcean account, you go to the billings page, and then you enter this credit here. It's Kim at uh, KubeCon EU 100. Um, there are a few things, though. If you are already a DigitalOcean customer and you've used a promo code in the past, you can't enter one yourself. So uh, we'll have to do that for you manually. We won't be able to do that until after the workshop. So you have a couple of options if you want to use that credit. Uh, the first one is you can Slack me on the CNCF uh, Slack. and. Send me your name and your email address, and I'll apply the credit after the uh, workshop. This is, what, uh, this is what I look like on the CNCF Slack. And then the other option is you can just create a new DigitalOcean account uh, with an email address that you haven't used before, and then you'll be able to apply the credit that way. Um, 
So, um, yeah, there are also uh, prerequisites in terms of uh, binaries that you want to download. Uh, so for every single chapter, you want a DigitalOcean account. Uh, you want to use Doctal, which is the DigitalOcean command line tool that lets you communicate with our API. Uh, Terraform, Helm, and Cube Control. I bet a lot of you have some of those things installed. For chapter two, you'll need a GitHub account and Flux CLI installed. For chapter three, you'll need a tool called KubeSeal installed. And for chapter four, there's nothing that's not in the list above that's required. And then finally, uh, so how to ask questions and troubleshooting tips. So the first thing is if you're working through the workshop and you get stuck, since there's so many of us, there's a process I'd like you to go through. So the first thing is if something fails out, reread the instructions that you just tried and run the command again. If that doesn't work, uh, Google the error. If that doesn't work, talk to somebody next to you or find Adam uh, or Wayne and ask them for help. And if you are uh, attending virtually, uh, ask a question in our Slack channel. Uh, you can also do that if you're in the room. And so that is uh, 2-KubeCon uh, custom extend Kates. Uh-oh, and it looks like there's some trouble with the video hanging for the virtual folks, so um, all right. So last thing before we, t we break and reorganize is that uh, I've got Annie here, who's our moderator. And so I'm gonna demo each chapter. After each chapter, that'll be the opportunity to ask questions. The way that it'll work is Annie will take a few questions from the virtual platform and ask those on the behalf of those uh, attending virtually. And then if you have questions, you'll uh, queue up at the microphone in the middle and we'll go through there. Um, so, Next thing we're gonna do, uh, I'm gonna put a 10 minute timer on. Uh, your job is to make sure you have a DigitalOcean account uh, and that you're all set up and then uh, rearrange as needed. So moving at your own pace is gonna be toward the back of the room. Uh, going step by step with me is gonna be at the front of the room. And then when the timer goes off, I'll get started with the demos. So ready, set, go. <laughs> If you guys want to get settled in, go go right ahead. Thank you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> oh come on. That's not that's not what I wanted. Gonna see how what people are doing. But I don't know, maybe it's one on two. Oh. I don't know if they're um can you put okay you already did. Um or somebody did. No, they're voting up so it means that likely there's at least three people. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, here is again. When I entered the promo code for validation it says did the code look like Ah, oh, okay, so they're saying that it should be okay. that one. I'll okay, thank you. <laughs>
Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hello, hello, hello. Check, check. Can you hear me? Hello? Okay. Hey, everyone. It seems like there's an issue with our promo code. We're going to look into that. If it doesn't get applied, uh, send me a Slack message, and I will fix that on your um, DigitalOcean account. Um, I will come see you in just a second. We've got three minutes, so you're just getting set up. Uh, if you haven't already, you can fork and clone that repo, and then we'll get started on chapter one, which is creating a cluster with Terraform. Perfect. All right, I've already got some Slack messages requesting me to take care of the code after the workshop. Thank you, I will definitely do that. All right, I think we're ready to get started. So the first thing we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna try and set up a cluster using Terraform. Uh, I'm lucky as the presenter that I have uh, you know, I have be probably better internet access than you do, so if your internet's timing out or if we're having issues with Wi-Fi, no problem, we'll watch the demo. So let's uh, head to chapter one in the repo. And so uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use Terraform uh, to create a DigitalOcean managed Kubernetes cluster. And so the reason this is part of a GitOps workshop is that uh, in GitOps, you have to use infrastructure as code tools. Uh, because you want to be able to define your infrastructure in files that you can commit and track with source control like Git. Terraform is an infrastructure as code tool. Uh, it uses declarative configuration files uh, that help you automate provisioning infrastructure resources like VMs, managed databases, uh, firewalls, or Kubernetes services. So what we're going to do in this chapter is we're going to use Terraform to create a managed Kubernetes uh, cluster. And uh, it's going to be a, uh, a kind of cluster that you see a lot in tutorials. So this is a diagram from the Kubernetes documentation. Uh, this diagram shows on the left a control plane. And then on the right, we see three worker nodes. And that's what we're going to be provisioning uh, in DigitalOcean uh, with this Terraform. So 
uh, if you're following along or if you're watching this um, after the presentation, uh, there are four tools that you need to complete this chapter. The first is a DigitalOcean account. Uh, the next is Doctal, which is the DigitalOcean command line tool. The next is Terraform, the command line tool. And then Cube Control, so that you can interact with your Kubernetes cluster. All right, so step one is you want to have access to the files in this repository. So you're going to want to fork and clone this repo. And then you're going to want to change into this repo. So on the command line, you see uh, the name of this uh, repo, which is KubeCon 2022 DOKS Workshop. And you've got two sets of instructions there. And then the second thing that we're going to do is we're going to configure Doctal so that it can communicate with the DigitalOcean API. And we're going to do that with a token. And so I'm going to tell you the steps, and then I'll show you. We're going to create a token in our DigitalOcean account. And then we're going to store that token as an environment variable. And then we're going to use Doctal uh, to authorize our account. And then we're just going to make sure that Doctal is actually communicating with our DigitalOcean account. So step one, we're going to create that API token. So this is the DigitalOcean control panel. Uh, I'm on the tab that says API, and I'm going to click Generate New Token. You give your token a name, so I'll say KubeCon Workshop. And then you can select when you want your token to expire. It goes all the way from 30 days to no expiration date. And you're going to want read and write permissions for this token. And then I'm going to generate that token. I'm going to copy that to my clipboard. Uh, and I won't be able to see that again, so I'm going to be careful with that. And then the next step is I want to store the value of that token in an environment variable uh, called DO token. So I'm saying export DO underscore token. And then I'm setting it to the value of that token. All right, I think that looks good. And I know that different operating systems have different ways of handling environment variables. Um, so you may just want to keep that token on your clipboard uh, and paste it in manually throughout the tutor tutor tutorial. All right, next step is we want to use that token to grant uh, account access to Doctal. So I'm going to run the command Doctal auth init. And Doctal is giving me a message that says, hey, I need your account token in order to do this. So it's on my clipboard. I pasted it. I'm getting a message that says that I was able to validate that token. And then I'm just going to double check and make sure that worked. Let me check the command. I'm going to say doctal account get. All right, and we see the information about my account, my email address, like what's my droplet limit? That's our VM product. Uh, has my email been verified and things like that. So I feel good that I'm able to connect to the DigitalOcean account from the command line. All right, and now the fun part. So in step four, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, look at a Terraform file. I'm going to move through the file really quickly, and then we're going to run Terraform apply. That'll take a few minutes. Uh, we'll go back to the file at that time and dig into it then. So in the repo uh, that we forked and cloned, uh, I'm going to open it with my text editor. And I'm going to the Terraform directory. And I have some additional stuff in there because I've already run a few commands. Uh, but doks.tf is the file that we want. And so we see some things here. We're using the Terraform DigitalOcean provider. Uh, you see we're going to be using the DO token uh, in Terraform. And so we have some lines that point to that. And then uh, we get to the good stuff. So uh, here, we're going to create a DigitalOcean Kubernetes cluster. We're going to call it the KubeCon cluster. And then we get to set some arguments here. And so uh, I've already got my name set, KubeCon cluster. This next one is important. Uh, you want to select the region uh, where your worker nodes are going to uh, spin up their droplets. So what DigitalOcean data center are you going to be using? 
If you want to see a list of those data centers uh, from the command line, you run this command, doctal compute region list. And you see uh, the list of all of our data centers. Um, and uh, for this exercise, uh, you want to pick a data center that is located geographically close to you. And you want to pick a data center that says it's available, that you can create resources in there. So I'm from Denver, Colorado in the United States. I usually use the data center uh, San Francisco SFO3 because it's closest to me and it's available. But now that we're in Valencia, Spain, um, I did some Google Maps sleuthing, and it seems like Amsterdam, London, and Frankfurt are all roughly the same distance from Valencia. Um, so uh, you can pick Amsterdam, uh, London, or Frankfurt. Just make sure that in the available column that it's listed as true, as available. So Amsterdam 2, I'm not going to use that. Uh, but I will use, it looks like Amsterdam 3 is available. And so uh, right now I have the London data center specified. I'm going to change that to Amsterdam 3. Again, pick an available data center that's located close to where you are. And then the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to specify which Kubernetes version uh, that's available through DigitalOcean Kubernetes are we going to use. So again, this doctal command will give you a list of those versions on the command line. So this is doctal Kubernetes options versions. And there are two Kubernetes versions available for you. Uh, the earlier one is 1.21.11, and you need the slug that has this dash do dot one at the end. And then the more recent version that we're going to use is 1.22.8. And so I just want to make sure I've got the right slug. Looks like version 122.8 is set. Uh, HA uh, is for our high availability control plane. We've got two control plane options right now. This one will spin up a little bit faster. And then this node pool block is where you specify information about the virtual machines that you're using for your worker nodes. So nothing that you need to change for this workshop, but you select the size of the nodes. Um, I've picked a basic AMD droplet with two vCPUs and four gigs of RAM. And then you specify whether or not you want those nodes to auto scale. And then you say the minimum number of nodes that need to be running and then the maximum number of nodes that are running so you can uh, have constraints on the size of your cluster. All right. So I said we weren't going to go through that too in depth, uh, but I wanted to go through the arguments. So we've got this Terraform file set up. And now it's time to run some Terraform commands. So. First thing you want to do is you want to change into your Terraform directory, and you're going to run Terraform init. So this is like running npm init or any other um, initialization commands. Uh, we're just making sure that the software is ready for us to go, and that uh, if we need to download any dependencies, that that's taken care of. I ran this command earlier, so you wouldn't have to see that. So it, it went pretty fast. And then my favorite command in Terraform is the next command, uh, which is Terraform plan. And so what this is going to do is Terraform's going to start communicating with the cloud provider API. And it's going to say, hey, this is what I am planning on creating in your cloud provider account. Is this actually what you want me to do? So uh, let's take a look at that. So I've got Terraform plan, and then I'm passing in an argument of the variable, and I'm saying what I named a lowercase do token in the Terraform file, uh, I actually want you to grab the value from my do token environment variable. All right, so here is the plan command. Nothing has happened. Terraform is just saying, hey, is this what you want? And um, I just, I, this makes me feel safe as a, someone who's creating infrastructure. It's saying with these green uh, plus signs, hey, I'm going to create a DigitalOcean Kubernetes cluster. It's going to be called KubeCon cluster. And then you see a lot of those arguments that we set. And you see some arguments that we didn't set that are going to get created in the cluster. And then Terraform will get that information later, uh, like the endpoint, like the created at timestamp, uh, like the kube config value. 
Uh, we've got a maintenance policy here. We didn't specify any of that, so it's just going to default uh, to whatever the defaults are for DigitalOcean, and then information about the worker node pool. So next thing I'm going to do, I feel good about that, the plan. Now I'm going to run Terraform Apply. So this is actually going to create those DigitalOcean resources. It gives us the same information again, uh, saying, is this what you want me to do? And uh, this time, you have to type the word yes in for those uh, things to be created. So now we have this, um, this message saying, hey, I am creating a DigitalOcean Kubernetes cluster called KubeCon cluster. Terraform gives us information, but I want to see if that cluster is actually spinning up in my DigitalOcean account. So I'm going to go back to the Cloud Console. And then uh, if you look at the Kubernetes cluster list here, uh, you can see KubeCon cluster, it was uh, spun up just now. All of those things are being provisioned, uh, but Terraform uh, initiated that action. I didn't do it from the web console, um, and so that's part of the beauty of Terraform. Now, I just did it as a human operator, but uh, hopefully you can see like, how you could make that. That's an automated process uh, where you have that infrastructure as code. All right. So uh, just to go back to the Terraform file, hopefully some of these things are looking familiar. You've seen them in a few other contexts. So we've got that variable uh, called DO token. Uh, we're pulling in information from the DigitalOcean Terraform provider. And then uh, there are all of these uh, DigitalOcean resources that we're creating. If you go to uh, digital or to the Terraform uh, provider page, you can see other uh, cloud resources that you can create. So um, let's see, I think I have that at the bottom here. So uh, once you get familiar with the Terraform documentation, um, you see here on the left, there are all these things that you can create with DigitalOcean. So uh, you can create a container registry using Terraform, uh, a database, a firewall, a droplets, a domain, basically anything you can create in the DigitalOcean Cloud Console or with Doctal you can create with Terraform. And uh, there are providers for so many things, uh, all the major clouds, AWS, Azure, and Google. Uh, Kubernetes has lots of resources that you can create via Terraform. Um, and so. Uh, that's just some of the power of what Terraform is looking through their directory. All right, let's check in on our cluster. Still creating. These clusters are probably going to take between four and five minutes to create, so we've still got a little while to go. Uh, but let's uh, take a look at where we are in the tutorial for chapter one. All right, so I ran Terraform apply, I entered yes, I'm waiting for that cluster to provision, and uh, I'm checking in a few places, but this message in our terminal is what's gonna tell us, hey, Terraform is done creating that resource. While we're waiting for Terraform to do that, uh, we can get set up to access our Kubernetes cluster using kube control. And so uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add an auth token or certificate uh, to our kube config file. And uh, here's how you do that with DigitalOcean. So uh, you go to your cluster, and on the getting started page, if you go to connecting to Kubernetes, You grab this doctal command, and I'm going to open a new tab so I can do this. And then I have information that says, hey, I added those cluster credentials to your kube config file, and I have changed your kube control context to that particular cluster. So if I say kube control config get context, I think I'm going to have two, my backup cluster, and then this cluster. Yeah, I've got both. So um, I have my backup cluster that I spun up prior to the workshop. And uh, I have the cluster that's spinning up now. And I should not be able to access anything in the cluster yet, because it's still provisioning. But I'll try anyway. Keep control, get nodes. It's taken a while. Yep, not ready yet to access. All right. 
And then the last step is what I just did, is I want to verify that the cluster is up and running and that I can connect via kube control. So uh, that's the command kube control get nodes. So uh, this is a good opportunity to stop, let you catch up if you're following along, and uh, we'll take questions. So Annie will ask questions from uh, the virtual attendees. And then if you have questions, if you're here in person, if you could line up at the microphone. No questions? All right. <laughs> well, uh, we'll take a few minutes. We'll let my cluster get up and running, and then we will move on to chapter two. And like I said earlier, if, if you've gotten what you needed or you want to go see another talk, I will not be offended if you leave now. Uh, I want you to have the experience. So. Just out of curiosity, raise your hand if you're following along with me, like running the commands. All right. Not a majority, but we've got a few. Cool. <laughs> and this, this repo will be available uh, for you after the workshop if you'd uh, prefer to do it some other time. All right, we'll check, see if the progress bar gives us any information. All right, we'll give it one more minute. If it's not done, we'll switch to my other cluster and then we'll hop into chapter two. Chapter two is exciting. It's uh, setting up Flux uh, to build a GitOps pipeline. Oh, and we do have a question, so uh, thank you. Go right ahead. <laughs> hey, Kim, thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? Brill. Um, so I noticed the, the API token, the scope of it was very broad. Mm -hmm. Is there other plans for DigitalOcean to have like uh, like tighter scopes on the API token. I know it's not exactly related to this, but I kind of clock that. Sure, yeah, I, I believe that's on our roadmap, yeah. <laughs> ah, cool, thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. <laughs> All right, well, let's hop into chapter two. So this chapter is titled, uh, Build a GitOps Pipeline with Flux. And I have found that uh, the term GitOps, to me, it feels sort of like the term agile or some other tech terms that get really overloaded with meaning from a lot of different places. And so I'll tell you my understanding of GitOps how we'll be using that term uh, in this particular workshop. And it's OK if you have a, a different understanding of GitOps. Um, but my understanding of GitOps in, is uh, it's a set of practices uh, where you make Git the main source of truth uh, for both your infrastructure uh, and your application code. Um, there are tools uh, for setting up uh, GitOps pipelines, uh, things like Flux CD, which is what we're going to install and use today, and Argo CD. Uh, and there are others, but those are two really popular C and CF back projects. So a GitOps tool is continuously like watching the state of your Git repos. And so if you make a commit and you push that commit and a change is noticed, then the GitOps controller says, I, I want to reconcile that. I want the, the change that's in Git, I want that to be true in the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and so it's that reconciliation process. Yeah, and uh, Flux CD helps you do that synchronization. And uh, it makes sure that uh, your state inside your cluster, whether it's your infrastructure or your application, matches what's in the Git repo. And so this is what we're going to be setting up in this next chapter. So we've already set up our DigitalOcean cluster. And we already have the control plane and etcd running. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use Helm uh, to install Flux CD. 
Uh, Flux uh, spins up a source controller and a Helm controller, and uh, it communicates with Helm and manages releases. And then on the right side here, you see uh, the people, that's us. And so when we make changes to our Git repository, uh, we push those changes. We're gonna push them to GitHub. And, uh, and then we, if we add them to a particular directory in our repo, uh, Flex, Flux is always watching that. Uh, and when we push those changes, Flux does what it can to make sure those changes are true inside of your cluster. So uh, this is hopefully a GitOps experience for you. So the prerequisites for this chapter, you need a GitHub account and you need the Flux CLI tool. So let me just double check on my cluster. Excellent. So this is the message from Terraform. Hey, I created that DigitalOcean Kubernetes cluster. I just want to verify I can connect. Uh, cube control, get nodes. Excellent. Looks good. All right. So installing Flux. The first thing uh, is we are going to bootstrap Flux CD and have it installed in our cluster. And uh, what we want Flux CD to be able to do is we want it to have uh, the ability to create GitHub repos and make changes to that GitHub repo. And so we're gonna do that through a uh, GitHub personal access token. So if you've never done this before, you go to your, oh, that's the documentation, which is also good, uh, but I'm gonna go to my GitHub account. And you go to your, uh, your icon and then you find the settings. And then all the way at the bottom, it says developer settings. And uh, there's GitHub, GitHub apps, OAuth apps, and then personal access tokens. This is what we're gonna create for Flux to use. So I'm gonna generate a new token. All right, I'm gonna unplug this real fast while I get my GitHub password in there. All right. What's this token for? Uh, we're gonna say Flux CD. Uh, expiration, we'll go seven days. And then there are all of these different scopes. Uh, we want Flux, like I said, to be able to do all the things to repositories in my account. So I'm gonna generate that token and I'm gonna copy it on my clipboard like before. And then uh, again, we're gonna store this as an environment variable in our terminal session. So I'm going to create an environment variable called GitHub token and then give it the value of that token I've got on my clipboard. So uh, I'm gonna go up a directory and I'm gonna say export GitHub underscore token. <clears throat> All right, and next thing, this is so, this is so exciting. I love this. Um, so we're gonna run this flux bootstrap command. Uh, it's gonna create a repository on my GitHub account. Uh, and I just need to make sure that anything in the angle brackets that I change the value of that. Um, so I'm gonna copy this whole command. I'm gonna paste it here. It's got a couple lines. So first I'm just saying flux bootstrap GitHub. Uh, Flux can bootstrap all sorts of different environments. It can do Bitbucket, it can do Git, it can do other things as well. Uh, but I want this to get connected with a GitHub account. Uh, next thing is the owner of the account. That is me. So this is my GitHub username, Kim Schles. I want it to uh, create or pull from a repository that's called KubeCon Workshop. The path that uh, Flux is going to be monitoring and then doing the reconciliation process with is called clusters-dev. And so I'm gonna hit enter, and this takes a little while. So it says connecting to GitHub. It looks like the repository was created and it's syncing. So let's go look at my GitHub account and see do I have that repo? All right, it created this KubeCon Workshop repo. Nice. 
All right, and uh, we've got all this information. So it says uh, deployment is ready, all components are ready. So let's see what got created inside this Kubernetes cluster. So I'm just gonna say cube control, get namespaces. So I have the default namespace and the other namespaces that come with a cluster, but I also have this brand new flux system namespace. So let's just look at the pods in there. Cube control, get pods from the namespace flux system. All right, so if you remember that uh, architecture diagram, these should look familiar. So we've got the Helm controller, which is running in a pod. We have the customize controller, so Flux really uses customize, a notification controller, and a source controller. And so just to look at this again, you see those components uh, now in the Kubernetes cluster created through that bootstrap command. And then uh, there are some nice flux commands where you can check that things are working. So if you run flux check, it'll check prerequisites. Last night I did this and it let me know uh, my flux CLI was out of date and so I updated it. You get some good information from that. If something fails, you can run flux logs to investigate and try to find out what's going on. This looks good to go. And then uh, we can say flux get all to inspect the uh, resources that flux has created. All right, it says, hey, I created a git repository um, and I'm gonna be looking at that. All right, I think we're good on that. Oh yeah, and then what was built into that repository? It looks like it should have three different YAML files. Let's, let's take a look at that. Inside the KubeCon workshop, we've got this sort of long file path, but we have those three, um, three files. We've GOTK components, GOTK sync, and customization. And these are files that are auto-generated by Flux. And uh, some of them are long. You shouldn't have to mess with them. And uh, they have some nice, uh, like a nice warning at the top. This manifest was generated by Flux. Do not edit. So you don't have to worry about those. All right, so we have Flux set up. We have a repo that Flux is listening to. And so the next step is we want to clone that repository onto our local machine, and we want to prepare a little bit more of the layout uh, so that we can have the sealed secrets uh, chapter work for us. So. Uh, this command is a git clone of the repository that uh, you created with Flux. So I'm just gonna grab this. I'm going to step out of that directory. And I'm gonna say git clone. And I'm gonna change into that, so kubecon workshop. Excellent. And I'll open that with my text editor. All right, next up, we're gonna create some new directories in that, uh, and it looks like we have a question, so go ahead. <laughs> yes, two questions actually. So how did Flux authenticate it with GitHub? Because you did not provide the GitHub token, so I would assume it took it from your terminal. And how did Flux authenticate it with Kubernetes cluster before creating the namespace? Excellent, so two good questions. One was, how does Flux authenticate to GitHub? And then how does Flux authentic authenticate to Kubernetes? Uh, I believe that the, yeah, that um, environment variable that we set, the GitHub token, that Flux is looking for an environment variable, named that in your terminal session. Uh, and then Flux also, I think, has access to your cube config file so that it can communicate with your Kubernetes cluster. Yeah. Thanks. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right, so uh, this is where it gets a little, uh, a little bit more complicated, uh, but we have some nice commands here for you. So I want to create uh, several different new directories. So one is going to be called Helm. Uh, one is going to be uh, inside the Helm directory, repositories, then releases, and then secrets. So copying this command should get you there. Uh, and once again, it's the clusters uh, dev directory is where you have to put uh, anything that you want Flux to look at uh, because that's what we specified in the Flux bootstrap command, telling Flux, hey, look here. So uh, let's make sure that we have uh, those directories. So we've got 
Excellent. So we've got Flux. OK, we've got Helm. Releases repository secrets. That's what I am looking for. All right, and then finally for Flux, uh, we want to add some items to our git ignore file. Um, and so the first thing is uh, we're going to, this is for a sealed secrets, we're going to ignore anything uh, with this values uh, dash dash values dash uh, dot yaml, and then uh, we're not going to ignore uh, sealed yaml files, uh, and we'll see what that is. I think I already have that in the git ignore, but let's double check. Yes, they are here. Those things are ignored. All right, so that is bootstrapping Flux to communicate with GitHub and your Kubernetes cluster. And now uh, the Flux controller is running, and it's going to take care of any of that reconciliation. And we'll see that in action in just a few minutes in the Sealed Secrets chapter. Uh, but since that's the end of the chapter, now is a good opportunity for questions. So we'll take questions from folks online. And then if you are in the room and have questions, if you could queue up at the mic. The mic, perfect, yes. Uh, so there's a question online. What would be your recommendation regarding Git repo structure, EA, the folders for close cross-plane providers, config along with the sealed secrets, resources, manifests, and so forth when working with GitOps? Um, I'm going to try and restate that question. So the question is, how do you approach structuring your Git repo? Does that, does that sound right, Annie? Yeah. yeah, so if you're following along, I would do exactly what's written in the, uh, the tutorial. Uh, it's sort of a mono repo uh, where everything's all in one repository. Um, but the thing that, um, honestly, that I struggled with the most was realizing that uh, you have to specify for Flux uh, which directory that it's going to be monitoring or which directories. And so being mindful of that. Um, yeah, for this uh, tutorial, we've got a Terraform directory. We're going to create some sealed secrets files. We've got cross planes. We've got a lot of stuff going on. Um, but uh, I, would, I would stick with the tutorial for now. And then once you get familiar with the tools, uh, then you'll have more confidence to restructure it as needed. Thank you. All right, we have a question. Hi, yeah. Uh, I have a question. You use personal token uh, for GitHub uh -huh. to connect to Flux, as I think, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, is, it, is there a way to avoid that? Because personal token is connected to you know a person. And if a person leaves a company, uh, you have an issue. <laughs> so is there a way to do, work around uh, that? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, we used a personal access token from GitHub uh, to give Flux access to our, uh, our, our GitHub account so it can create and make changes to a repository. Um, so. Uh, you could uh, do that through like your work, like the work uh, organization. And I'm sure there are other ways of handling that, uh, but I don't know them off the top of my head. Um, so I can do some research on that, or I can hop over to the Flux booth after this and talk with the Flux maintainers. But I'm, I'm guessing there's a better way. <laughs> OK, thank you. Yeah, good question. All right. Um, We've got about 40 minutes left. We've got two chapters. Um, oh, we've got one more, or we have more questions. So uh, let's let's take that question. Um, I've seen that um, uh, you bootstrap the the flux uh, stuff uh, with an imperative uh, command. There is a way to do it uh, in a declarative way. Oh, is there a way? Oh, that's a great question. So the question is. We used uh, like an imperative paradigm with Flux, uh, where we ran the commands from the command line and we passed in the arguments. Uh, is there a way to do it declaratively? So using like infrastructure as code, uh, that is a great question. I don't know the answer right now, um, but uh, I'll find out and share it in the Slack channel. Um, or if you do the research and find the answer, let me know and I'll share it with the, the group. So uh, excellent question. Yeah, in the spirit of GitOps and infrastructure as code. Uh, not running those uh, commands uh, imperatively. All right, uh, well, let's take just a minute. If you need to stand up and stretch, uh, you can do that. Um, and then we'll hop into the next two chapters. Yeah. <laughs> so.
Oh, say that again? The, the Slack channel, how can I connect? Oh, yes. Um, my name is Kim Schlesinger. <laughs> um, All right, so we've spun up a cluster with Terraform. We've installed uh, Flux, continuous delivery. And the next thing uh, that we're going to do is look at a project called Sealed Secrets. So in GitOps and using infrastructure as code, if you want Git to be your source of truth, you want to be able to publish files and not worry about it. But one thing that's really tricky is when you have confidential data like API tokens or passwords or database connection strings, things that you don't want to commit to Git uh, or GitHub or GitLab, whether or not the repository is private, things that are not safe uh, to put in there. And so uh, there are a lot of different solutions for this in Kubernetes. And today I'm going to show you a project called Sealed Secrets. Um, so let's look at the diagram. So you can see our cluster is getting a little bit more complex. So we have our DigitalOcean Kubernetes cluster. We have Flux CD inside of it. We've got our control plane running. And then uh, on the right here, you see there's a sealed secret object and a sealed secrets controller. So we're going to be installing that inside our cluster. And then uh, on the outside of the cluster, like where the developer or the platform engineer is, uh, we're going to encrypt Kubernetes secrets using a tool called kubeseal. And then uh, that's going to give us uh, an encrypted string that's OK to push uh, to your Git repo. And uh, inside of sealed secrets, uh, there is a private key that will decrypt your secrets inside the cluster. Um, so that's how we're going to handle that. So uh, let's, let's see what we're going to do. So in order to complete this chapter, uh, you need to have completed chapter two. So you'll want Flux CD set up, up and running, uh, using the same structure that we did uh, in the tutorial. And then you'll also want a command line tool uh, from the Sealed Secrets project called KubeSeal. All right, so let's hop into setting up uh, sealed secrets. So the first thing that we're going to do is uh, we're going to create a uh, Flux custom resource called Helm Repository, uh, but we're going to set up a Helm Repository for sealed secrets. So uh, let's see, the instructions say uh, change the directory uh, where your Flux CD Git repository was cloned. So let me make sure I'm in the right projects. Yep, so I'm in KubeCon Workshop. And then uh, we're going to use Flux to create a uh, sealed secrets Helm repository with this command. And I'm just looking through, is there anything that I need to change? I just need to make sure that I have an environment variable called Flux Helm manifest path. So let me check that. Yes, so those are some of the directories we set up, clusters, dev, and Helm. So I'm good to go there. And then I'm going to copy this 
and paste it. All right, so it says Flux Create Source Helm Sealed Secrets. We've got some explanations for the commands, and we're going to have a new file. Oh, wrong, wrong place. And here it is. So it's a YAML manifest. Uh, we're using uh, Flux CD custom resource. It's called Helm Repository. And so if you've ever run Helm uh, from your command line where you have to install a Helm repository and then specify the chart that you want to create the release from, uh, this is how Flux does that uh, declaratively in a YAML manifest. So we're saying, hey, create a Helm release called Sealed Secrets. Uh, put it in the Flux system namespace, and then you're going to pull it from the sealed secrets uh, directory, or from the sealed secrets repo. Actually, that's just the Helm repository, not the Helm release, but that's okay. All right, next thing that we need to do is uh, we want to have some values set for the sealed secrets uh, Helm release, and so we're going to set the version of sealed secrets that we're using, and we're going to pull a values file uh, from a different project. So we'll just run this command. And I'm expecting to see uh, a file that starts with sealed secret values. Yep, in my kubecon workshop file. So looks good. Not a whole lot of values set here, but we have uh, ingress uh, is not enabled right now. All right, next thing. Now we're going to create the Helm release. We have the sealed secrets repository. Um, and so uh, looking at this long command, uh, we're creating a Helm release called sealed secrets controller, uh, specifying the release name, the source, uh, the chart, the chart version, the values that we're going to apply to that Helm chart, uh, and uh, where that file is going to be created. So just in the root of the KubeCon workshop directory, running that command, and then we should see another file. Oh, it's in repository. Oh, no, that's wrong. It's in releases. All right, so we have this Helm release with all of that information, so declaratively creating a Helm release. And then next, uh, we want Flux to see those changes and to uh, enter into the reconciliation process. And so we're going to add all of those files uh, as a git commit, and then we're going to push that commit to GitHub, and then we're going to see Helm uh, create those uh, new resources. So um, in this command, uh, still setting the sealed secrets chart version and just adding the new files that we created with those Flux commands. All right, so adding those, I'm pushing that to my uh, GitHub repo. Let's just take a look at that and make sure those changes. Okay, I was updated 10 seconds ago. Great. And then uh, let's let's just do a let's do a flux logs and see if we can see what's going on. All right, so we see. Flux is in that reconciliation process, and we see like a Helm chart is being created. Oh, it says uh, no artifact available for Helm repository. And then uh, let's take a look at what's, oops, cube control, get namespaces. Uh, let's see what's in the Flux system namespace, what's new. So cube control, get pods from the Flux system namespace. All right, so we've got the sealed secrets controller, which was created 40 seconds ago. So that was installed because we made that change in Git and GitHub, and Flux noticed the change and then did that reconciliation process. So we've got the state of our cluster now matches the state of our Git repo, which is uh, GitOps, making Git the single source of truth. All right. Um, so the Flux controller, I think it runs uh, one minute, every minute uh, by default. So if you apply a change and you want to see it happen right away, uh, you can run this command uh, where you force a reconciliation, uh, Flux reconcile. Yeah, and then uh, just to see that Helm release one more time. All right, it says it's ready and that reconciliation succeeded. All right. Next up, we are going to uh, export the sealed secrets public key. So a uh, 
public-private key pair was created inside of the Sealed Secrets controller, and we need to have access to the public key uh, so we can use it to uh, encrypt our, our secrets that we don't want people to see. And so, uh, the, this happens uh, in one of two ways. So you can try this cube seal command uh, where you're grabbing the controller from the flux system namespace, <clears throat> excuse me, and you're asking for the cert and you're saving it as this file. This doesn't always work for me, so let's see if it works. Nope, that didn't work for me. And so uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to port forward the sealed secrets controller and uh, then I'm going to uh, yet yeah, use a curl request uh, to get the certificate uh, from the API endpoint. So I'm gonna copy this. I'm gonna open another tab. All right, so it looks like uh, that pod is port forwarding and then I'm going to run this command and I want a pub sealed secrets .pem file in my kubecon workshop directory. Oh, it looks like I already, oh, maybe it did work that first time. Oh, no, it created the file, but there's nothing in there. All right, so did that curl request succeed? Yes, so now I have the public key on my machine. Uh, I can stop that port forward process and back to the instructions. So I now have uh, the public key and, uh, oh, it looks like uh, it's safe to commit that to Git. Um, so I'm going to uh, commit that and push to GitHub. Excellent. All right. Next thing, uh, we're going to encrypt a Kubernetes secret. So this is what I think is the exciting part is we're going to have some data uh, that we wouldn't want to have in a Git repo and we're going to encrypt it using uh, kubeseal and sealed secrets. So I'm going to create a, a Kubernetes secret and I'm going to call it your-app-secret.yaml. So I'm gonna say touch your-app-secret.yaml. And I'm gonna paste this YAML manifest. So this is a secret, it's called your app. And then here is the data. This data is base64 encoded, but that isn't uh, strong enough uh, to have it out publicly. And so what we wanna do is we wanna use kubeseal to transform this string into something that can only be decrypted by the private key that's in the sealed secrets controller. So how do you do that? So we're gonna run a kubeseal command. We're gonna ask it to give us output that's YAML. Uh, we're gonna have it create that new updated secret in the Flux system namespace. We're telling it the name of the public key. Uh, we're telling it the name of the file where it's going to uh, encrypt the secret. And then we're giving it another file name. Uh, it's called your app sealed. That's gonna be the file that we commit uh, to GitHub. So let's run this command. Let's see, do we have your app sealed? YAML. So I have your app secret. That's the one I don't want to commit. I have your app sealed. Ah, here's the one I want to commit. So this has been transformed from a generic Kubernetes secret into a custom resource from sealed secrets called a sealed secret. <clears throat> It's got some of that information we passed in through the commands, and then look at this encrypted data. This is safe to commit to a public GitHub repository, so you are good to go uh, with having safe and secure secrets. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna delete that file that has the secret in it, and I'm gonna keep the sealed file, and then I'm gonna commit that uh, to Git, GitHub, and then sealed secrets controller. We'll take a look at that, <clears throat> it will decrypt the secret, and then we'll take a look at that. So, <clears throat> all right, I already got rid of that uh, your app secret file. Oh, this is beautiful. I don't even have to run a flux command. I can just use kube control apply to create uh, that sealed secret. So, <clears throat> all right, <laughs> kube control apply your app sealed. Excellent. And then uh, if we look, kube control gets secrets from the namespace flux system. Oh, there's a lot there. 
All right, so we have uh, the Your App secret uh, and it's opaque. It was created 10 minutes ago. So that sealed secret got turned into a regular Kubernetes secret. And uh, we can inspect the secret to see if it has the decrypted data. So let's see. <clears throat> All right, so there's the base64 encoded string uh, that sealed secrets uh, decrypted. So we've got that secret in the Kubernetes cluster, uh, but it wasn't committed to Git or to GitHub. And then uh, we're not going to do this step, but optionally, uh, if you would feel safer, you can uh, create a, a private key backup. And we've got some instructions there. And then a list of some security best practices and then some resources. So uh, we just use sealed secrets to uh, create the sealed secrets controller uh, so that we can encrypt secrets from our command line, commit them to Git, GitHub, uh, and then they are decrypted through the sealed secrets controller in your Kubernetes cluster. So that is the end of that chapter. Uh, we'll take questions. So we'll do questions from the virtual attendees first, and then I see folks in line. And then we've got one more thing, which I'm super excited about, which is using Crossplane to spin up some cloud resources, and then we'll be done. Any questions from uh, virtual attendees, Annie? OK, no questions from virtual attendees, uh, people uh, in the workshop. <laughs> yeah. My question is uh, the CRD, so the sealed secret, the file that we created, uh -huh. you did the kubectl apply, but so this file isn't managed by Flux. Oh yeah, that was not managed by Flux. We oh did we commit it? No, we didn't. Uh, but if we committed it, I think Flux would reconcile that. So it's not in a specific directory. It's at top level, right? Yeah. So yes. Oh, that's a good point. You'd have to put it in that dev clusters directory. Okay. So it's not managed if it's there. OK. That's true. Yeah. Thank you. Uh-huh. Hi. I would have the same question, uh, but another one. OK. What would you recommend to not accidentally commit your unsealed secrets file, maybe a, a pre-hook, uh, pre-commit hook? Something like that? That's a great question. So the, the workflow that I showed you where you created the, the secret with the base64 encoded string and then you manually deleted it, I think having a, a, a guardrail like a webhook or some check on that is a really good idea because it would be very easy to accidentally commit that. Um, so yeah, putting some uh, boundaries around that, uh, some automated processes to check that would be, would be a very good idea. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hi. Where is the sealed secret private key stored? The sealed secret private key is stored in the sealed secret controller pod. Um, so when we did the port forwarding and we asked for the public key, uh, the private key is also stored in that same place. Thank you. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> I wasn't sure we were going to get through all the chapters, but I think that we are. We've got 20 minutes left, uh, so we will do uh, some cross-plane. And then if you're following along, I'll show you how to tear down your cluster and clean up any resources so you don't get charged. And then we'll be on our way. So this next chapter is called uh, Make Your Cluster a Universal Control Plane with Cross-Plane. And so Cross-Plane is a CNCF-backed tool that allows you to create cloud resources from inside a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so you can make a cluster a universal control plane. Um, I think Crossplane is really exciting. It took me a couple of, of days to sort of understand uh, some of the exciting parts of it. Uh, but what we're going to do in this part of the workshop is we're going to install the DigitalOcean Crossplane provider in our cluster. And then we're going to spin up a DigitalOcean droplet that's just totally separate from our cluster. So you can see us provision some cloud resources. So um, the next part, which we probably won't get to, is uh, that you would pick a different provider. So all the major cloud services have cross-plane providers. Big projects in the cloud native world have uh, have have uh, cross-plane providers. Cloudflare has one. So hopefully, when you see the pattern of how you install the provider and create the resource with DigitalOcean, you'll be able to apply that pattern to another provider uh, and get up and running with cross-plane. So uh, this chapter has no special prerequisites uh, aside from uh, the tools that you need for all the chapters and having a Kubernetes cluster. 
And so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to just create a separate namespace uh, where we do all of this installation. So uh, we're going to say cube control create a namespace called cross plane system. And I'm just going to make sure it did what I expected. All right, cross plane system. Next up, so I'm doing this all via Helm, and like some of you have already pointed out, you could do this all in Flux, absolutely. Uh, you'll, you'll have to use your imagination, though. I'm, I'm going to do this just from the command line. So I'm going to add the cross-plane uh, repository, and then I'm going to update it. Uh, I'm guessing I already have that in my Helm repository, so I'm just going to run the Helm repo update command. Excellent. And then I am going to use Helm to install the cross-plane Helm chart in that cross-plane system namespace, so through this command. Excellent. So getting the information that cross-plane has been installed, Let's take a look. We'll just look at the pods in the cross-plane system namespace. All right, so I have a cross-plane pod and I have a cross-plane RBAC manager pod. Excellent. So that's the first step. If you want to use cross-plane for any of the providers, that's the first thing you need to do is install cross-plane somewhere in your cluster. Now we're getting into the provider-specific instructions. So we're going to install the DigitalOcean cross-plane provider, and I have that defined in a file called uh, install.yaml. So back to the uh, repository for the workshop, going to cross-plane and just looking at the installation manifest. So uh, I'm using a cross-plane CRD called provider, and I'm creating a provider that I'm calling provider DO for provider digital ocean, and I'm uh, installing it with this particular package. So I'm going to run a cube control apply command on that. It's in the cross-plane directory. Oh, I'm in the wrong directory. All right, let me try that again. So cube control, apply the cross-plane install manifest. Cross-plane install. All right, it says that was created. So now if we say cube control get provider, We've got one provider, it's the provider DigitalOcean. If you were using multiple, like if you were using a Google Cloud provider, you would see that one as well. Uh, if you were using Cloudflare, you would see that provider installed. So we're ready to uh, talk to the DigitalOcean uh, API, or almost ready, uh, getting there, to talk to the DigitalOcean API from this Kubernetes cluster. So next step is, we want to configure two different things. One's uh, a secret, and one is the uh, config provider. And so uh, I need that DigitalOcean token value again. Let's see if I'm still in the same session. Excellent. So I'm going to use that in just a minute. And uh, we need to put that in this file. So we have the config.yaml. So uh, here's where the token's going to go. There's a placeholder here called base64 encoded provider creds. And I just have a little comment here. This is an opportunity to use sealed secrets. So I won't be able to do that right now, but this is a place where you would use sealed secrets. So you could commit this file uh, up to a public repository. So I have to uh, base64 encode this value. And I have some instructions if you've never done that before. Uh, you can do it from the command line. Uh, I'm not sure how it's done in Windows, but, uh, and I'm not sure how much you trust DuckDuckGo, but if you, if you search base64 and then a string value in DuckDuckGo, it'll give you the base64 encoded value. Um, so I'm going to echo that. All right, so there's my base64 encoded value. You've got to have that for a Kubernetes secret. All right, so uh, here's how Crossplane's going to communicate with my DigitalOcean account using that token. 
And then the next thing that we're going to do is uh, set up this custom resource called a provider config. It's going to be called DO example, and it's going to pull the credentials from this secret that I created above the cross plane, uh, this uh, d provider DO secret. So I'm going to apply the config file. So cube control apply cross plane config. All right, no error messages, so it looks like it's good to go. And then the next thing, this is where I think it's so cool, um, is we're going to create a DigitalOcean droplet from the cluster, from inside that Kubernetes cluster. And so uh, with Crossplane, uh, any like resource that the provider offers, you can probably create it uh, using a YAML manifest. And so for DigitalOcean, uh, there is a custom resource called a droplet. You give it a name, and uh, these things should look familiar. You say which region, which data center region that droplet's going to be created in, uh, the size of the droplet, uh, the image you want that droplet to use, uh, and then the provider config ref. Uh, it just has to be the same name as the config ref that we that we created here. So let's look at our cloud console. Let's look at droplets. So these are droplets for um, the Kubernetes clusters that I have running in this account. And what I want to happen is I want a cross-plane droplet to get created. So uh, let's do it. So cube control, apply, cross-plane, and then droplet.yaml. It says the droplet was created. And if we look at the cloud console, hey, the droplet was created. So that droplet was created from that Kubernetes cluster. I didn't create it from my command line. Uh, I didn't create it uh, you know, using Doctal or from the web console. Um, but just like a little, a little bit of the power of what Crossplane can allow you to do in terms of being a universal control plane. So that is how you create a droplet uh, on using the DigitalOcean cross-plane provider. Uh, if you're working through this uh, tutorial in the future, uh, so the next steps is that you would choose a different provider to install. And the steps are very similar. You install the provider. You set up uh, however they like to authenticate, probably a secret with a token. And then you find a resource that you want to create from your cluster. And uh, this is the official list of cross-plane providers. Um, so you see AWS, GCP, Azure, Alibaba, you've got Rook, Helm, Terraform, SQL, GitLab, Equinix, Metal, Sivo, uh, Argo, uh, Styra, Cloudflare, so many things. So um, just imagine if you want like your Kubernetes cluster to sort of be like the mothership. It can create all of these things. And this is a way for you to implement multi-cloud infrastructure. Uh, maybe you use DigitalOcean for something, but you also use uh, Google Cloud uh, resources for something else. Uh, you can set up a cluster that can handle all of that. Uh, so that is the cross-plane part of the tutorial. Um, and Crossplane does so much more. I wrote a blog post about it for DigitalOcean a few weeks ago. Um, and the power, part of the power of Crossplane is that if you are a platform engineer, uh, you can create different resources that you give to application developers that maybe they don't want to know much about your infrastructure, but you want them to be able to spin up like databases or, or whatever you want. Um, but uh, Crossplane also gives you that power um, where your platform engineering team can define special resources and tell your application team, hey, if you need to do some tests or you need to spin up this or that, here's how you do it. Um, so I, I can't speak highly enough of Crossplane. I think it's a really exciting project. Um, so that is the end, except for one thing, of the workshop. The last thing is uh, destroying your cluster with Terraform. And so um, you don't want to get charged uh, for having resources running that you're not using. And so uh, you can just destroy your cluster with a Terraform destroy command. So I'm changing into the Terraform directory, and I'm destroying it. Terraform is like, hey, do you want me to get rid of all of this stuff? And I'm going to say, yeah, I do. 
and it's destroying that. And then I'm going to just manually destroy this droplet that I created. Excellent. And that is that. Um, so we'll take questions. Um, and uh, if, if you haven't left already, I would love if you, if you learned something or you want to ask me questions, come up to the front. I have a few t-shirts and tote bags and a ton of DigitalOcean stickers. I'd love to meet you and talk about that. Again, Slack me uh, if you need those credits. Uh, apologies that the credit codes didn't work. But we'll take questions from online, questions from uh, the folks in person, and then we'll be done. Perfect. Um, so there was two questions from the Q&A box. Uh, can sealed secrets convert a YAML with string data so you don't need to base 64 encode as you're removing, removing a secret file after you've converted it to a sealed secret anyway? OK, so the question is, can sealed secrets, uh, does it, do you have to base 64 encode the, the secret before giving it to sealed secrets? And I believe it's a Kubernetes uh, constraint that the secret uh, data must be base 64 encoded. So, uh, so yes, you have to have that there. <laughs> Great. So uh, how should we maintain the universal control plane, which is basically another cluster in a GitOps way? Is it recoverable if it goes down? Great question. So how can we maintain like the universal control plane in a GitOps way? Um, uh, I guess you would want to have a very strong disaster recovery plan. So planning for, let's say this cluster goes completely online, like what is the plan uh, to handle that? Uh, so that's like the scope of a different talk and workshop. Um, but um, yeah, I. Uh, like using all of the things that we were exposed to today, like Terraform, Flux, maybe use Argo CD instead, like uh, finding a way to like get all of your pieces in a GitOps workflow uh, so that um, if you have a cluster that goes down and everything is defined in Git, uh, in theory, you would be able to spin up that cluster using tools like Terraform and Flux. Um, so that's how. All right, a couple questions uh, from the audience. Thanks. Uh, there was another question in the channel I want to highlight. It was about um, using Flux with, for example, 100 microservice oh, repos, yeah. so multi-repos. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend uh, for these amount of repos regarding conflicts, for example? Yeah, so the question is, what if you are running 100 microservices and they you know, each have their own individual Git repo? Um, I think Flux would be able to handle that. Uh, you have to configure Flux to uh, you know, listen inside of those uh, repositories. Uh, but if you had like, a good templating system uh, for your teams to copy and use, uh, I, think, I think that would, that would uh, help you use Flux for all those microservices. Different. Different repos can have conflicts uh, between each other, right? How do, would you resolve them? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'll try and find out. <laughs> OK, thanks. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I noticed that you uh, removed the cross-plane creative resources manually. My question is whether cross-plane has the ability you know, to manage the drift <laughs> or manage the life cycle of the cloud resources mm -hmm. in a way like um, Argo City Flux does it? Yeah, Crossplane does have that capability. We've got a bug in the uh, DigitalOcean provider, so that's why I had to do it manually. But yeah, you can destroy, you can, you can use Crossplane to get rid of resources as well. Good, good eye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, thanks so much, everybody. Thanks for those of you who are watching online. Uh, I'm Kim. Uh, come say hi. I'll have a mask on, get some swag. Um, uh, reach out to me on the CNCF Slack workspace or send me an email, especially if you need those credits. Uh, we'll get those applied as soon as possible. Thanks so much. <laughs>